was the center of intellectual discourse in ancient Greece. Amen. Uh, let us, before I go into the sermon, uh, take the anchor passage from the sermon. And the sermon is located in the book of Acts, chapter 17, from verses 22 all the way to uh, 28. Now, I'm reading Acts 17, 28. For in him we live and move and are. Now, some of your versions will say, have our being as a one of your own poets, as one of your own poets says it, we are the sons of God. See, so the apostle Paul was saying to the uh, uh, men and women of Athens, the philosophers who were all guarded to hear him, he was revealing to them that there is a holy adoption that has taken place. And that holy adoption is the reason that God, the almighty God, is our Abba Father. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, just to give a little bit of a backdrop to this message, the revealing of the unknown God, uh, when Paul was making his missionary journey across the world, speaking about Jesus, the Christ, and how that, you know, um, you know his gospel had come not only to the Jews, but to the entire world, there were a lot of strange reactions to the message. One of them in this particular instance was the reaction from the men of Athens. They said to Paul, they couldn't quite figure him out. They said, um, we suspect, and the men of Athens in the, in, the, in the ancient world were the intellectuals, the philosophers, the ones who knew, you know, who were more sophisticated in their intellect. And they uh, surmised that what was happening with uh, Paul was that he was talking about a foreign god, they said. And they did not lack any gods, you know. So they were quite uh, concerned that he was talking about yet another god, you know. So it is one thing to preach to a people that share the same culture. It's another thing to preach to a completely different set of individuals with total difference in thoughts, total visions of life, and so on and so forth. So now at the very beginning of the message, Paul adopted a strategy and he wanted to not bring something to the Athenians that they had no knowledge of. He couldn't bring something new because that would really fulfill, or that would uh, basically confirm their suspicion that he was coming on with a new thing. So verse 22, as Paul stood to speak at this famed arena, uh, where Socrates and Plato and all of the other philosophers stood in their time, uh, he said, men of Athens, I know this, that you are very religious people. For as I was out walking about, I saw many altars, and one of them had this inscription on it, an altar that was dedicated to the unknown God. And then he declared to them, you have been worshiping him without knowing who he is, and now I wish to tell you about him. So you see the clever approach that Paul had was to say to them, I am not coming to speak to you about a new God. I am not coming to speak to you about an alien God. I am instead coming to reveal unto you the identity of that God that you call the unknown God. He instead was saying to them, I have not come to tell you something brand new. I have instead come to give you revelation knowledge of a God that you have worshipped without knowing, of a God that you have devoted an altar to but had no knowledge of. And then he proceeded to tell them about this God. And two things were uppermost in his thesis. One, he presented the unknown God as the creator. 
you know, in verse 24, it says, this God that you don't know, he made the world and everything in it. And since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, he does not live in man-made temples. You cannot idolize him. You cannot build a statue to him. You can't fit him into any kind of a dwelling place. Verse two, and human hands cannot minister to his needs for he has no needs. He's self-sufficient. You know, he is God all by himself. You know, he doesn't need us to be God. Amen. So he himself gives lives, gives life and breath to everything and satisfies every need there is. So the Athenians are sitting down wondering, whoa, okay. And then he cre and then he talks about not only being the creator, but the second uh, um, dimension of his revelation is that God is the provider. He is providence. He has no needs. He instead, he provides. He gives needs. He satisfies every needs there is. He created all of the people of the world from one man, Adam, and scattered the nations across the face of the earth. Now, this was a bodacious claim because the Athenians are sitting here saying, wait a minute, you mean that we have the same origins? You see, so here is the discourse, the topic, the, 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 uh, the kernel, if you will, the essence of his message in this famed arena. See, diverse sermons have been preached, you know, where the apostles preached to the Jews or Gentiles who have had an acquaintance and a, ver a veneration for the Old Testament and, and people who were worshipers of the true living God. And all they had to do with them was to open and allege that Jesus is Christ. But here it was slightly different. Here we have a sermon to unbelievers people who worshiped false gods. And there was no paucity of gods in, in Greece. They had hundreds of them. Every uh, facet of life had a God that was in charge, God of war, the God of love, you know, the God of music, the God of this, the God of that. So they were not a paucity. There wasn't a scarcity of gods. So to come on to them, they were worshiping without the true God in the world. And to the to them, the scope of this discourse was quite different from what it was to the others who had a sense, who had a little bit of history. You see, in the case of those people, the Jews and Gentiles who knew the Old Testament, all that, all the business of the apostle or the preacher was to lead them by prophecies and miracles in the Old Testament to the knowledge of the Redeemer, the Messiah, and the faith in him, in the latter, where they don't know God, and but they have no knowledge of the Old Testament, no, no acquaintance with it, the task was a little more complex. It was to lead them by the common works of providence, that God made this, God created that, and to bring them to the knowledge of the creator and the worship of him. See, one discourse of this kind had happened before in the city of Lystra, where the idolaters, you know, heard the message and immediately proclaimed the apostles, the sons of God. You know, this is in the book of Acts chapter 14, verse 15. They proceeded to say, these men are the sons of God. And this is recorded uh, here to be more polite and uh, that refined idolaters at Athens and had the same admirable discourse. So in presenting the, the God of the universe, they had to be careful that they didn't become themselves deified or treated as gods or worshiped as prince of God. You know, so they had to, they had a difficult task to proclaim that this knowledge, it comes from the uh, revelation of Christ and the uh, teachings of Christ without appearing to be of a superior breed, you know, made a little lower than the angels who possess this knowledge. Amen? Hallelujah. So from this discourse, we go into 
a second aspect of it and fixate now on the creator. You see, really when he's talking to the uh, Greeks about, or the Athenians about the creator, he is uh, threading a very uh, small needle. And he's saying, he made the world and everything in it, including you. And since he's the Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't leave in man-made temples and human hands cannot minister to his needs for he has no needs. He himself gives lives, life and breath to everything and satisfies every need there is. Now, if he seemed like I read this before, yes, I did, I'm reading it again. He created all the people of the world from one man, Adam, and scattered the nations across the face of the earth he decided beforehand which should rise and fall and when, and he determined their boundary. Now, this is very powerful. Verse 26 of chapter 17 of the book of Acts speaks about the predestined knowledge of God. That this God that we're talking about, he is all-knowing. He is almighty. He is ubiquitous. He's everywhere at once. So he, in his knowledge, his knowledge is infinite because he knew beforehand who, which countries or which nations would rise and which ones would fall and when. And in some of your versions, it would say he set the habitations of their dwelling. He predetermined that you and I will live in this century in the United States of America and that we would leave in a little town called Chester in New York. See, God has no contingencies because he is not taken by surprise. He knows all things, he sees all things, and he has infinite knowledge. So let us now go to the other kernel of this sermon at the Areopagus, Mars Hill, and deal with the subject of knowledge. The Apostle Paul lays down this as the scope of this discuss. He aimed to bring them to the knowledge of the only living and true God as the sole and proper object of their adoration. He is here obliged to lay the foundation and to instruct them in the first principle of all religion, that there is a one God, you know, the Lord God, the Shema, that there is only one God and the Lord God is one. You see, so the, here is, you know, a very important part of his, of his foundation is that he's saying, we don't have multiple gods. We don't have, I know you have hundreds of them. I am not dissuading you, you know, from that, but I'm telling you that there is one who made all the others. One who does not have any needs. One who cannot be served by the hands of men. And one who is all sufficient. Hallelujah. Elohim, El Elyon, the Lord of hosts. So when he preached against the gods they worshipped, he had no desire to draw them into a state of unbelief. He didn't want to say, oh, your beliefs are wrong. You know, but he brought them to the service of the true deity. He says, I know you really understand that God ought to be worshipped. But I want to correct the mistakes that you've made. You're worshiping all these different false gods. You already have an inkling. You have an instinctual you know, uh, 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 foundation. You have dedicated an altar to the unknown God. And I, Paul of Tarsus, I have come to declare to you today that the unknown God is the true God of the universe. He does not introduce any new gods like we said earlier, but reduce them to the knowledge of one God, the ancient of days. Hallelujah. So was the, you know, the approach of Paul. He brings them to a brink by telling them that you are worshiping you know, gods. You even have an altar dedicated to an unknown God. Here is this unknown God, Deus absconditus, the unknowable God, that I have come to tell you about. Who is this unknown God? He says, to the God whose honor it is to be unknown 
and that they intended the God of the Jews, whose name is ineffable. You see, when, you, when Moses was commanded to go to Pharaoh, he asked, he says, he, what, who shall I say sent me? And God himself said, tell them that I am, that I am sent you. His name is ineffable. His nature is unsearchable. So it is probable that the Greeks heard from the Jews, from the writings of the Old Testament, of the God of Israel, who had proved himself to be above all gods, but was a God hiding himself. The prophet Isaiah in chapter 45, verse 15, speaks to this unknowable, unsearchable God. The heathens or the pagans call the Jews God. Deals in certus, meaning the uncertain God. Now this God, says Paul, who cannot by searching be found out to perfection, this is the one God that I declare to you. I am not talking about a new God. I am not talking about a new sensation. I am not talking about a new discovery. I am revealing the ancient of days who has always been ineffable, who has always been unsearchable, who has always been our God, but revealed in degrees of progression. Hallelujah. So the Jews were absconded. And then he says, furthermore, let me talk about his attributes. Hallelujah. He says, let me talk about this God and his attributes. He is almighty. He is all-knowing. He is ubiquitous, which means he's everywhere at once. Not only is God's whole being incomprehensible, but each of his attributes, his greatness, his power, thoughts, ways, wisdom, and judgment are well beyond human ability to fathom fully. He says, not only can we never know everything there is to know about God, we can never know everything there is to know, even one aspect of God's character or work. So he's positioning the Athenians and himself as humans who only have partial knowledge of God. The knowledge of God is infinite. There's so many, is so multidimensional that there is no way to tell you fully who God is. God cannot be explained. He can only be experienced. So here is Paul's invitation to the men and women of Athens, the intelligentsia, the, the philosophers, the wise ones. He says, come and experience God because I cannot try as hard as I can explain him to you. Hallelujah. You know, so this almighty God, this unknown God, Dios Absconditus, this God that they did not, you know, understand who they worshiped is what Paul is redirecting them to. And here is the redirect. He tells them that the God he preached to them was the one that they already worshiped. Therefore, he was not a set of forth of new or strange gods as, as he was perceived. He's not a babbler who's coming with some foreign thing that they had to you know, uh, unearth and, and discuss. But as you have a dependence upon him, so he had some kind of homage from you. He was one whom they ignorantly worshiped, which was a reproach to them, you know, who were famous all over the world for their knowledge. The Greeks at the time sat at the peak of the intelligentsia. Everything that had to do with philosophy, everything that had to do with democracy, thought, government, civilization, the Greeks were at the peak. And to say that they ignorantly worshipped a God that they did not know was a reproach to them. Now, Paul declares, I come to take away that reproach that you may worship him understandably whom, how you have worshipped ignorantly. It cannot be acceptable to have your blind devotion. It cannot be it cannot but be acceptable to have your blind devotion turned into a reasonable service that you may not worship you know not what. He confirmed his doctrine of one living and one true God by his works of creation and providence. Hallelujah. 
So this sermon at man's, uh, Mars Hill, the Rocky Hill, the Areopagus, the celebrated arena where the Greeks had their intellectual discourse, these uh, buildings you saw in the foreground was the hill, the Mars Hills they called Areopagus. This sermon revealing the unknown God was Paul's way of speaking to the highest echelon of the society at the time and letting them know that the Lord God Almighty is the one who is, who was, and is to come. There's nothing new about him. The, the, the uh, Greeks erected an altar to, he, to him, unbeknownst to them. They called him the unknown God. And here is Paul explaining that that unknown God, that unsearchable God, is the one that I'm preaching to you today. Hallelujah. This was the turning point for the men of Athens that many came to believe that here is a God, the unknowable God, the universal God, the one who has not restricted himself to just one race, to just one geopolitical group. He is the Lord God of Israel, but he is also the Lord God of the entire world. Hallelujah. So this proclamation, this missionary journey, this singular you know, uh, uh, speech was the beginning of Christendom in this part of the world. Hallelujah. Now, so today the relevance is we serve a God who is all-knowing, the one true God who is able to save us from a life of sin and a life of bondage. Now, I want to give an opportunity to anyone who has not made the Lord their personal Savior. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 of the Living Bible says, if you tell others with your own mouth that Jesus is your Lord and you believe in your own heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Hallelujah. Now, I want you to pray with me, saints. Now, if you've prayed this prayer before, there's nothing wrong with dying to ourselves daily. But if you have not said this prayer before, and even if you are repeating this prayer in the aftermath of this broadcast, the promise endures. If you, the only prerequisite is that you pray, believe it in your heart, and repent genuinely, and the Lord God will fulfill his promise. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins, and I invite you to come into my heart and life today, this Sunday, May 14th, 2023, this Mother's Day, come into my heart, this hour, this minute, this second, this instant. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. Amen and amen. Now, fr friend, if you just said that prayer for the first time, welcome to the kingdom of God. Welcome to the kingdom of that unknown God, that one that the Athenians erected a, a, an altar to. Welcome to his kingdom. Hallelujah. Now, I know that we have an adversary who roars around like a mighty uh, roaring lion. And there are things that he seeks to steal, to kill, and to destroy in our lives. I leave you with three quick instructions of how to maintain your salvation. There are three things you must do. Number one, talk to God every day. Believers call that prayer. You know, talk to him every day. You know, uh, you say, talk to him about what? Everything that you care about, all of your needs, all of your requests, all of your supplications, all of your challenges. He is your Abba Father. We are adopted. We can call him our, you know, a heavenly father and relate to him in that way because Christ, you know, bequeathed with his work on Calvary. We are joint heirs with Christ now. Hallelujah. Now, number two, read the Bible every day. God talks to you through his word. You say how? You will read a familiar verse of scripture. God will speak to you in the same manner that Paul is revealing to the Athenians, the unknown God. God will reveal to you through his word, words of revelation, words of wisdom, and bring solutions to problems that you are encountering or people in your orbit are encountering. Number three, 
Join a Bible-believing church. You will grow and mature into the purpose of God's calling in your life. You have a standing invitation here to join us here at Grace Gate, you know, every Sunday. We thank God for your life. We thank God for his word today. And we pray that everything you've heard today, that God will bring to your remembrance and that all that we have, you know, uh, shared with you today will be part of your life, that you will apply it in your life and it'll be pleasing in the sight of God, that you will know for a fact that this God that we serve, he is not a new God, he is not a new fad, he is not just the God of the Jews, he is the God of all the earth, who was, who is, and he, who is to come. Hallelujah. He changes not. Amen. Let us 